Can you see my slide now? Yep. Okay, so let me go ahead and begin. Um, so first of all, uh, I'd like to also say thank you to Jan and David for putting together this very nice online workshop. I hope, um, I hope that we all have an opportunity in the near future to see each other in person. But in the meantime, uh, this has been a great substitute and I've really uh, uh, been enjoying it and I've found it very stimulating. Uh, the title of my talk is Thermalization via Low Dimensional Chaos. Um, and here the term chaos refers to the very, uh, uh, the, uh, the extreme sensitivity to initial conditions that we often find with classical Hamiltonian dynamics, or even more generally with uh, deterministic dynamical systems. Um, this idea of chaos is closely related to, but not identical with, the concept of ergodicity. Ergodicity is the property that a trajectory may be able to explore all of the phase space that's available to it, uh, consistent with, let's say, energy conservation. And both of these ideas, chaos and ergodicity, somehow lie at the foundations of classical statistical physics. When we think about a macroscopic system consisting of many, many degrees of freedom that's capable of self-thermalizing, then at some level we're implicitly assuming that the microscopic dynamics of that system are chaotic and ergodic. In fact, ergodicity was in introduced into statistical physics by, by Boltzmann himself way back in the, uh, in, in the 19th century. And it's often used to justify, for instance, the microcanonical ensemble. Now, in the, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, it became widely appreciated that uh, you don't have to have very many degrees of freedom in order to have chaos and ergodicity. In fact, you can have systems with as, as few as two degrees of freedom that can be both chaotic and ergodic. And a classic example of that is the Bunimovich Stadium Billiard that's shown over here. So this refers to a single particle that's moving around in two dimensions. It's enclosed by this kind of stadium-like box, and it moves in straight lines apart from collisions with the walls of the box. And Leonid Bunimovich um, was able to prove rigorously mathematically that this system is, uh, uh, is both chaotic and ergodic. So it displays extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, uh, and also a generic trajectory evolving in this system will explore all of the phase space available to, uh, consistent with a, um, uh, uh, with, a fixed, with a fixed total energy. So because you can have systems with just a few degrees of freedom that are both chaotic and ergodic, it seems kind of natural to act, ask, could such a low dimensional chaotic ergodic system act as a kind of miniature heat bath? Um, and if it could, then how does such a heat bath compare or contrast with the more, um, uh, uh, more traditional ways that we tend to think of a heat bath with many, many degrees of freedom. So this is the question that I'm gonna be looking at, and I'm gonna be looking at it specifically within the context of Brown Brownian motion. So Brownian motion, as you all know, is a kind of paradigm in classical statistical mechanics, and that's illustrated over here. A Brownian particle is imagined as a kind of large particle with a very large mass compared to the masses of a number of other particles in that constitute a fluid within which this Brownian particle is embedded. So we think, for instance, that the Brownian particle has, uh, let's say, three degrees of freedom, whereas the surrounding fluid, which is the thermal environment, has you know, the proverbial 10 to the 23rd degrees of freedom. Um, and as you know, if, the, uh, if there's a sufficient uh, difference, if there's a sufficient separation between the mass scales of the Brownian particle and the fluid particle, then that translates into a, um, a, a, a large separation between the time scales associated with these, with these two systems. And then using standard arguments, one can show that, um, that the Brownian particle itself evolves under effective dynamics, which are given by this Langevin equation over here. So the net force on the Brownian particle due to its collisions with all these gas, uh, with all these fluid particles, the net force, or equivalently the rate of change of its momentum, uh, uh, has two terms in it, a friction-like term shown over here, a friction term, and then a noisy or stochastic term, which is generically modeled by, uh, by, by white noise. And as we all know, that the, the friction and the noise are related to one another by a fluctuation dissipation relation, and the combination of these two terms then causes the Brownian particle to thermalize with the fluid. So it reaches a state of equilibrium where it's at the same temperature as the fluid. Okay, all of this is basically, you know, kindergarten level uh, 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 Brownian motion. 
Um, and what I'd like to do now is look at the question, what if we replace this mini particle thermal environment by a low dimensional chaos? So just to have a specific model in mind, although the analysis I'm gonna be presenting is more general, but for a specific model, let's imagine the following. So suppose I take one of these stadium billiards and I kind of chop it in half, I cut it in half, I close off one end by a massive piston M. So this piston here is the analog of the Brownian particle. Um, and then inside this half stadium, I have a single light particle that's bouncing around off of the walls of the stadium or the half stadium and off of the, off of the piston as well. And I also have a spring that attaches this piston to a, a, a fixed wall over here. This is kind of irrelevant. I, I just have it over there so that the piston doesn't fly away. Um, it doesn't, it's not gonna play a, a, any essential role in the, in the discussion. Um, as before, I'm going to assume that the mass of the uh, fluid particle, so here I have essentially a one particle gas. The mass of this particle is much, much less than the mass of the piston, and I'm going to introduce a, a smallness parameter, epsilon, which is the square root of the ratio of the masses, and I will assume that this parameter is much, much smaller than unity. And ultimately, this parameter will uh, represent a difference in time scales between the very fast motion of this particle and the slow, ponderous motion of, of the piston. So in this toy model, we have a slow and heavy piston coupled to a light, fast, chaotic particle. Uh, and I should mention that uh, uh, this particle, when, when the piston is fixed, this particle here is still chaotic and ergodic just as it would be in the full stadium. There's no essential difference between the half and the full stadium. So the question is, um, does this fast particle act as a kind of miniature heat bath on the slow particle? And in particular, can we write down some explicit effective equations of motion for the piston? Uh, do they look similar to the Langevin equation that we get uh, in traditional Brownian motion? And do these equations of motion lead to equi equilibration between the piston and the particle? Uh, just to give a preview, the answer to all these questions is yes. So what I'm going to do is kind of describe um, results that were uh, uh, published in this paper that was uh, 25 years ago. I worked on this problem back when I was a young and innocent postdoc. Um, uh, and so I'll just kind of summarize the results that appear here, the derivation of these results, you'll have to go to this paper to, to find out. And I should mention this work that I did was really building on previous work by people like Ed Ott, uh, Michael Wilkinson, and Michael Berry and Jonathan Robbins. Basically, uh, Ott and Wilkinson and Berry and Robbins analyzed the average force felt by this piston uh, uh, due, to, due to a particle like this in a more general setting. Um, and my contribution was to look at the fluctuations around the average uh, and, and to ask what are the consequences of those fluctuations. And it's those fluctuations that make the connection to Brownian motion and more, general, more generally to statistical physics. Okay, so that's a preview, but let me stay for, uh, uh, for, for just another minute or two with this, um, uh, with this particular model, then before I move on to the more general analysis, because this model gives us a, a good amount of um, uh, a good amount of intuition. So we have this intuition that this fast particle that's rattling around here extremely quickly exerts a kind of rapidly fluctuating force on the system. So very schematically, the force felt by the piston as a function of time might look like this very jiggly uh, red line over here, where I can view this as the sum of an average term, f bar of t, which is changing slowly with time. Let's say that's changing as the piston moves into or out of the single particle gas. And then there are these, the, there are these fluctuations around the average. In the limit where epsilon goes to zero, and what I mean by that is in the limit where the fast particle is moving infinitely more rapidly than the slow piston, in that limit, one can ignore these fluctuations altogether. And that's, that should be intuitively plausible, but it can also be justified mathematically. It's known as the principle of adiabatic averaging. And it turns out that when you analyze the system in this limit, you find that um, the force acting on the piston can be expressed as the minus the gradient of an effective potential uh, 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 that's created by, by this single particle gas. Of course, there's also the spring over here, but like I said, that spring isn't particularly relevant, so I'm not paying attention to it. Uh, and this is really the classical analog of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Remember, in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, molecular dynamics are analyzed by imagining um, that the nuclei form these slow, heavy classical systems, and the electrons are fast systems uh, where the ground state energy of the electron 
parametrized by the positions of the nuclei form a kind of effective potential for the nuclei. So the same sort of thing is going on over here. So for instance, if the slow particle moves very slowly into the gas, the energy of this particle goes up and therefore the kinetic energy of this one must go down. So effectively it's creating a potential energy for the slow particle. All right, but I'm gonna be interested in going one order beyond this Born-Oppenheimer approximation because at this level, there are no fluctuations. Um, so let me look a little bit more detail on, uh, uh, on that, at that leading order. I'm going to let A of R denote the area enclosed by this half, um, half stadium as a function of the position of the piston. And I'm going to let omega, uh, uh, which is a function of the energy of the fast particle and the position of the piston. So here we think of the posi position of the piston for a moment as a fixed parameter. Omega is given by, is defined by this integral over here. This is an integral over the phase space of the fast particle. This is a unit step function. And here little h is the Hamiltonian for the fast particle parameterized by the position of the of the piston. This integral represents the phase space volume enclosed by the energy shell E in the, in the phase space of the fast particle. So it's all of the phase space in the fast particle's phase space that uh, up to a given energy E. And this quantity turns out is an adiabatic invariant. It's called the ergodic adiabatic invariant. This was first derived by Hertz back in 1910, although I think it took another half century before the mathematicians actually proved it to their satisfaction. And when I'm saying this is an adiabatic invariant, what I really mean that is that if R changes very, very slowly, then the energy of the fast system will evolve in such a way so that this quantity remains fixed. For the particular example that we're discussing over here, one can easily show that this, uh, 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 this value omega is just given by 2 pi me times this area, A of R. This is just the 2 pi me is just an integral over the momentum space. And so what this is saying is that if the piston moves slowly either into the one particle gas or away from the one particle gas, then the energy of the gas evolves so that the product of its energy in this area remain constant. So effectively, there is an effective potential U, uh, U of R, which is inversely proportional to this A of R. Okay, that's what it looks like in this, in this model. Now let me do the more, the more general setup and just simply present the results that I, I derived in that paper I mentioned. So I'm going to let R and P denote the position in the phase space of the slow system. For specificity, let's assume this has three degrees of freedom. I'm going to let Z, little z, denote a point in the phase space of the fast chaotic system. And I will write down a full Hamiltonian for the slow and fast system, which is of this form. It's a kinetic energy for the slow system plus the energy of the fast system parametrized by the position of the slow system. And now, uh, so no notice that the, the Hamiltonian itself is time independent. So the total energy is preserved under the dynamics generated by this Hamiltonian. And now I'm, I'm going to assume that when R is fixed, the dynamics generated by this little Hamiltonian are chaotic and ergodic in the phase space of the, of the fast particle. Uh, uh, so I can view that as, as follows. So the coordinates, the axes here schematically represent Z space, the fast particle phase space. And for a fixed position for the slow particle, this kind of uh, peanut-like shape is the energy shell corresponding to a particular energy of the fast particle. So this is all, all of the points in phase space where the fast particle has a particular energy E. Uh, omega is the volume of phase space enclosed by this energy shell. And the squiggly line here is meant to represent a trajectory of the fast particle. So when R is fixed, this trajectory is restricted to the surface of this energy shell by energy conservation. And the assumption of ergodicity just means that if I watch this trajectory for a long time, it's going to visit all regions on the surface of that energy shell. Okay, so that's, that's the basic setup. Now, in general, I'm going to uh, be interested in the evolution of the slow and the fast system together. That's evolution generated by, by this Hamiltonian. Um, uh, so I have Hamiltonian dynamics in the full phase space. And so if I let F denote a time-dependent phase space density, now talking about the full phase space of slow and fast degrees of freedom, then the master equation that governs this phase space density is just the Liouville equation. That's written down over here. The 
curly brackets here represent Poisson brackets. If you're not familiar with that, don't worry about it. I'm not going to be analyzing this in detail. I'm just writing that, this down as this is kind of the starting point. This is the most fundamental microscopic description of this uh, classical of this classical system. Uh, so now my strategy is to try to solve this equation perturbatively in the smallness parameter epsilon. Um, and then having solved it perturbatively, project out the fast variables z to get effective dynamics for the slow system. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume that, um, that the uh, total energy, I'm going to assume a given total energy for the, uh, uh, for the combined system. So for any single trajectory, of course, the total energy of the combined system is fixed because this Hamiltonian doesn't depend on uh, uh, time. But I'm going to assume that we're looking at an on ensemble where all of the members of the ensemble have the same total energy. That's not necessary, but it makes the presentation easier. Okay, so here's the fundamental equation that we have, the Liouville equation in the full phase space. I'm going to now let rho denote the uh, probability distribution in the slow particles phase space. So I get that from F by integrating out the degrees, the fast degrees of freedom. And when I analyze this equation using multi-time scale analysis, and I'm, uh, I'll have to leave the details of that to the paper, what you find is that at leading order, to order epsilon to the zero, this distribution in the slow particles phase space uh, satisfies this very simple equation. And if you think about it, this is just the Liouville equation for a particle evolving under an effective Hamiltonian U effective. So I'll let, I'll let this equation, uh, I'll denote, I'll use this operator L0 uh, to denote this equation. Um, uh, this effective potential is just the Born-Oppenheimer potential that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, just for future reference, this effective potential is defined up to an overall constant by this equation over here. The gradient of this effective potential is given in terms of that phase space volume omega and its derivatives in terms uh, with respect to R and P. Okay, so what this is saying is that to leading order, and this is we had already discussed, the slow system evolves under Hamiltonian dynamics in a potential landscape that's created by the fast system. So this is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. This master equation can also be represented at the single trajectory level by these deterministic equations of motion. All right, um, we wanna go one level beyond. So it turns out that when you push the multi-time scale analysis to second or, uh, sorry, to first order in epsilon, you get the following corrections. So here's the zeroth order term that I've already mentioned. And then we get uh, another term over here, which is a derivative with respect to P sub i. Kij is a matrix, Pj over M. I'm using the con convention that I'm summing over repeated indices. So this is a sum over i and j. And here I have a second derivative with respect to momentum. And there's another matrix that appears here. Lij. I'm going to re refer to this as the uh, friction tensor and this as a diffusion tensor, and that it'll be clear in a moment why I'm making that reference. Those references. Um, this equation can be written down uh, in single trajectory form, or can be or is represented by the single trajectory form as follows: uh, dr dt is equal to p over m. dp dt is minus the gradient of this effective potential um, plus a velocity dependent force over here, which is just uh, uh, proportional to the vo velocity through this matrix K, and a, uh, a fluctuating stochastic force over here, which is represented by a vector F of T, which is white, white noise, and the correlation function of this vector is given by this, uh, 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 this, this matrix L. Okay. Finally, let me just mention that we can take this matrix K, divide it into its symmetric and anti-symmetric term. You can always do that with a matrix, with a square matrix. Um, and then uh, the contribution from the symmetric term just ends up acting as a kind of friction-like force on the particle. The contribution from the anti-symmetric term acts as a magnetic-like force. So you can convince yourself that an anti-symmetric matrix uh, multiplying, multiplying this uh, velocity gives you a force that's proportional to the velocity, but perpendicular in direction to the velocity, just like, just like a magnetic field. Um, so these forces, the friction and the magnetism, were derived more than, uh, more than 25 years ago by, by Barry and Robbins. They called this deterministic friction and, and geometric magnetism. Um, but you can already see here that there's some elements uh, of this problem 
that are related to the Brownian, or similar to the Brownian particle uh, uh, problem. Remember, in that case, the Langevin dynamics included friction and noise term. And here we also have a friction-like term and a noise-like term. So let me now kind of push this analogy further. Um, again, this is the result that I've mentioned so far. It turns out that this friction tensor K is related to the diffusion tensor L by this simple equation shown over here, where the quantity the sigma that appears here is the, the derivative of the phase space volume omega with respect to energy. Um, and I should mention that the energy of the fast particle here is not an independent variable. That's just determined by the energy of the whole system minus the kinetic energy of the uh, slow particle. So this is starting to look a little bit like a fluctuation dissipation relation. I mean, again, we can push that analogy even more. Um, using this result, I can combine these two terms into one term shown over here. And so I have that to first order an epsilon. This is the master equation uh, that describes the motion of the, uh, the slow heavy particle. Um, the, uh, is the effect, effective equation of motion for the slow heavy particle. And the final result is that under these dynamics, um, and basically using the same approach that uh, Boltzmann used in his H theorem, under these dynamics, one can show that any distribution in the phase space of the slow particle evolves asymptotically with time to this time independent distribution, which is proportional to this function sigma mentioned over here, evaluated at uh, this energy E, my, total energy minus kinetic energy of the particle. And you, if you think about it, this represents a kind of equilibrium between the slow particle and the fast particle, because if omega represents the volume of phase space enclosed by the energy shell, then sigma is kind of like a surface area of that energy shell. More properly, sigma is a measure of the amount of phase space that's available to the part, fast particle when it has an energy E. So this is telling us that in the long time, the probability, long time limit, the probability of finding the slow particle at a particular point in its phase space is just going to be proportional to the amount of phase space that's available for the fast particle, uh, given that the slow particle has this, has this much, um, ha has these, uh, uh, these coordinates. So the, the system, slow system relaxes to a kind of state of equilibrium, but this is not necessarily a, a Boltzmann, Boltzmann state. And if, uh, uh, if uh, David, if you could tell me, if, is my time already up? Uh, no, you're, well, you're going into your Q&A, but you're okay. followed by a discussion section. So, okay, so I, I, I will wrap up. What I was going to show in this slide, so these are the, the results that I've already shown. What I was going to show in this slide, if I had more time, is that if the fast particle actually does have many, many degrees of freedom, if the fast system does have many, many degrees of freedom, then the results that you see over here just um, reduce to the usual ones that you would expect from ordinary Brownian motion. So the relationship between friction and diffusion is just a proportionality relation with temperature playing this role. And this density of states then just becomes proportional to the Boltzmann factor. So this is just kind of a sanity check that in the limit where you have many degrees of freedom, you get the result that you expected. So summary, I've studied a slow system coupled to a fast chaotic system. I've shown that to, uh, uh, to first order in epsilon. These are the equations of motion, effective equations of motion that you get on the slow system. And they include a friction-like force, a magnetic-like force, and a no noise term. And these are re related by a fluctuation dissipation relation. The system comes to equilibrium. There, an equilibrium is established, though it's a non-Boltzmann equilibrium between the slow and the fast degrees of freedom. And so this intuition of the fast particle uh, 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 acting as a kind of miniature heat path seems at least to some extent to be justified by this analysis. A uh, couple potential questions to, um, uh, to follow up on are, you know, can this be extended to, to quantum systems? And there's been already some progress on this uh, by uh, Doron Cohen in Israel. And a particularly interesting question maybe for this audience was, is, does this problem fit naturally into some kind of maybe generalized stochastic thermodynamic description. Some stochastic thermodynamics, we're certainly familiar with uh, uh, Fokker-Planck equations, which is essentially what this is, or Langevin equations like the one over here, but the equilibrium here is a non-Boltzmann equilibrium, so how would that change things? And also, are there any fluctuation theorems that arise here or any kind of uncertainty relations 
these are open questions. And with that, let me thank, uh, uh, thank the organizers and I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions.